The year is 2008. You're enjoying your Saturday cartoons, and on comes a commercial for a game where you collect and fight dinosaurs. You watch it and go, huh, that looks pretty good, and bust open your piggy bank so you can convince your parents to take you to GameStop and buy it. You spend the entire drive home reading the back of the box over and over again. Dig and duel. Dig and duel. Dig and duel. Until you finally get home, throw the cartridge into your DS, and experience one of the most underrated games you may ever play. Welcome to Fossil Fighters. Fossil Fighters is an RPG for the Nintendo DS where you dig for fossils, clean them off, use the bones to revive dinosaurs as well as other beasts forgotten by time, and create a team of them to fight against other fossil fighters. I played this game all the way back when it first came out and loved it. I didn't remember a lot of the story details, so I decided that I would revisit the game on stream over at twitch.tv slash adamant, and you'll want to see just how crazy the story gets towards the end. We start our game off on a boat speeding towards Vivisaur Island, an island conveniently shaped like a dinosaur skull with plenty of biomes and areas for us to explore. On our way there, we are asked by the captain what our favorite dinosaur is. Being the basic dino fan I am, I went with a T-Rex, and this choice would decide what our character would look like. Black and red, not too bad. Once we arrive, we are greeted by Beth and Sue, the lovely ladies working the harbor. They welcome us to the island and introduce us to the expert on fossils here, Dr. Diggins. He may be a little scatterbrained and odd at times, but you'll see later why this guy is the man. Sue takes us over to the fossil center, the main hub for all of our cleaning and reviving needs, and then we check into the hotel. We check out our room and head back to the fossil center to meet with Dr. Diggins and begin the process of receiving our fighter's license. Diggins teaches us how to clean fossils, explaining that while we may find plenty of dinosaur body parts, we cannot revive a dinosaur into a vivisaur unless we find the head of the dino. But even with just the head, the vivisaur won't be very strong. But when you find and clean other body parts, like the arms, body, and legs, the Vivisaur will get stronger, learning new abilities and increasing its stats and rank. Diggins also explains that Vivisaurs are not one-to-one -one clones of original dinosaurs, which is why they look different and have different names. He then bestows upon us our very first fossil to clean. Now fossil cleaning is something that you do a lot in this game, so it's important that you learn how to do it and do it well, because the better that you clean, the better your Vivisaur is upon revival. Cleaning a fossil is really quite simple. You plop the fossil onto a table, and you have three tools. An x-ray that lets you see the fossil inside for a few seconds, a hammer that lets you break away chunks of rock at a time, and a drill that lets you remove the small bits and details to get your fossil out. You can also blow into the microphone to remove any dust on the table, but I don't think my chat was too enthused by that. Did it work? Oh, it worked! Let's go! We clean our first dinosaur head with a smashing success, and revive the fossil into Spinax, who was one of my favorites growing up because of how cool he looked. I mean, he's literally the first one you get, and look at all those cool spikes he has. Spinax will definitely remain a fixture of our team for the entire playthrough. We then head over to the fossil stadium to take our cleaning and battle test. The cleaning test just required us to clean a fossil with a certain amount of points, but then it was time for our first fossil battle. Okay ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Fossil Battles 101. I'm going to quickly run over everything you need to know to become a professional fossil fighter, so stay with me here. Fossil Battles are 3v3 battles between Vivisaurs. Each fighter's side of the field looks like this. There is one attack zone, two support zones, and one escape zone. Each Vivisaur is able to attack once per turn using any of their abilities. Now, these abilities cost Fossil Points or FP, which is a resource that you gain at the beginning of every turn, as well as when one of your Vivisaurs are knocked out. Stronger abilities typically cost more FP. Now these abilities can do many things, from dealing damage, to applying status effects, to healing, and more. Each of these colored zones are unique as well. Let's start with the attack zone, or AZ for short. Vivisaurs in the AZ deal and take more damage, and they can attack any Vivisaur in the opposing attack zone or support zone, which I'll go over now. The support zone is a bit more complex. See, Vivisaurs in the support zone take less damage and deal less damage, but this is where the support part comes in. See, most Vivisaurs have a unique trait called support effects, which are essentially buffs or debuffs that they give to either your AZ or the opposing AZ. These effects can greatly change the battle for better or worse, and most battles are won by utilizing the support zone to its fullest. Now during your turn, you can swap a Vivisaur from your support zone to your attack zone, and that attack zone Vivisaur will then move to the escape zone. The escape zone is exactly what it sounds like. When a Vivisaur is moved to the escape zone, it removes most status conditions applied to it, and it can't attack or be attacked. After two turns, that Vivisaur is then rotated into the empty support zone where it can then attack and apply support effects. One final thing, there's a very simple type chart to follow. There's only five Vivisaur types. Air beats water, water beats fire, fire beats earth, and earth beats air. Then there's neutral Vivisaurs, which are, well, neutral to everything. That is pretty much everything you need to know about fossil battles, so now it's time to get our fighter's license. We head down the hallway to the stadium and find out our opponent is none other than the captain of the ship that took us to the island. We take him down with a few Spinax fangs, and just like that, we are a licensed fossil fighter. 
We go back to the rest of the hotel, and then the story can officially begin. We wake up the next day and meet Dr. Diggins at the Fossil Center, who introduces us to KL33N, or Clean, our new robot cleaning assistant. We rush over to a trial dig site and meet with B. Ginner. I'm telling you right now that many character names are just puns, so be ready. B takes us to the trial dig site where she gives us a sonar and a pickaxe that we can use to dig up new fossils. We find a new fossil rock and bring it back to clean so we can revive it into a Shan Shan, who will be a nice little placeholder on our team until we get the vivasaurs we really want. We head back to the trial dig site where we have a battle with a young fighter named Holt as an introduction to battles with multiple vivasaurs, but he is no match for us, and we get access to our first real dig site, Greenhorn Plains. Inside Greenhorn, we dig up as many fossils as we can and bring them back to clean. We find the head of Goyle, who has good support effects and will help our team out a lot in early game. We even grab an arm fossil for Spinax, giving him a new ability and a rank up. Back in Greenhorn, north of where we were digging, a supposed staff member of the fossil center was blocking off a supposed rare fossil bed, and in order to access it, we needed to hand over our dino medals, as to not damage the fossils. Now I knew right away that this staff member was going to just take my medals and run, but we gotta advance the plot somehow, right? We hand over the goods and start digging in the rare fossil bed. And what do you know? It's all garbage. We head out to give the staff member a piece of our minds and let clockwork, he's gone. Yet conveniently, he dropped our dino medals on the ground as he was leaving. A young girl who also had her dino medals stolen named Rosie comes up to us and wants us to help her get her medals back. We head to the police station to talk to Captain Bulwark, who concludes that whoever steals dino medals will most likely want to fight with them at the fossil stadium. We head over there and fight someone using three of Rosie's dinosaurs named PBJ. We defeat PB and give him a stern talking to, only to find out that he was sold these dino medals by a man named Metal Dealer Joe, who according to him, was most likely in Greenhorn still. We travel back to the scene of the crime and come face to face with the thief himself. We challenge him to a fossil battle for the fate of everyone's medals, but our vivisaurs with multiple body parts overwhelm his team, and we save the day. The police come and scoop the ruffian up, and we find out that our first level up battle is now available back in town. We rush over, breeze through the cleaning test, and move on to the battle test which is against Wendy, the receptionist at the Fossil Center. But her assortment of weak vivisaurs are no match for ours, and Spinax decimates her team to give us the rank of level 2 fighter. After the fight, we catch up with Rosie and her grandfather, Richmond, who ends up being the owner of the entire island. He thanks us for helping his granddaughter, and Rosie heads off for her level of battle as we retire back to the hotel. The next day, we see that we have unlocked a new dig site, Knotwood Forest. We hop on the boat over there and start digging up fossils, where we find the second important member of our team, S-Raptor. S-Raptor is a fire vivisaur that has similar damage output to Spinax, has solid support effects, low FP attacks, and can knock enemies from the attack zone to the escape zone. We throw the striped dino onto our team and venture deeper into the forest until we come across Digadig -dig Village, where all of the villagers are wearing tribal garbs and masks. They notice that we are fossil fighters and ask for our help. We are taken to the chieftain, who tells us that in the back of the village lies the ancient Digadigamid, a structure that holds many ancient treasures. But recently, the ancestral key to said treasure was stolen and the fossil fighter originally sent to help has not returned in days. We agree to help the chieftain, and they express their gratitude by randomly striking Rosie with a bolt of holy lightning, somehow giving her foreign accent syndrome and causing her to speak in their dialect, something Rosie is not too happy about. While Rosie is being tended to, we head into the Digadigamid alone, and are jumped by a shady guy in purple. We defeat him, which is already strange enough, but on the next floor, we are attacked by a dog? It's not like it bit us or anything, it challenged us to a fossil battle. With a substantial amount of confusion, we accept his challenge and walk him like a, well, a dog. After we were done with Nintendog, we took some of the new fossils we found in the Digadigamid back to clean, and revived probably the MVP of this entire playthrough. My sweet, precious, adorable Patchy. I mean, look at this guy! He's an Earth type that debuffs the opponent a little, but he is a long range vivisaur, which means that he deals the same damage from the support zone as he would from the attack zone. If you look at competitive tier lists, Patchy may be at the bottom, but that doesn't sway me one bit. We will take this adorable, long-range, headbutting vivisaur all the way to the end. We travel back to the Digadigamid and delve deeper, this time being stopped by a man who could poke your eye out a mile away with just his nose. He challenges us with an Egyptian-looking vivisaur, but with Patchy by our side, we are untouchable. In a display of trickery, the long-nosed man flips a switch, opening a trapdoor sending us to an unknown part of the Digadigamid. We come to and... what's this? Yo! Yo, 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 yo! Whoa, 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 I was not told about the amount of baddies in Digadigamid. This fine woman introduces herself as Nevada Monte Carlo, the fossil fighter that was sent here before us. She had fallen for the same trap as us and explains that the thieves call themselves the BB Bandits. She tells us that there may be a Kemanite fossil here, that it can act as a natural skeleton key to get us out. 
but her sonar is broken, so she needs us to do it. We find one and clean it to get us out of this prison. We head all the way to the treasure room of the temple and catch up with the bandits. We meet a female bandit named Vivian, and she reveals that the dog's name is Rex and the long-nosed man is Snivels. A little on the nose, as you might say. The trio tricks us once again and traps us in the treasure room with no way out but to solve a puzzle. The only clue we had was this writing on the wall of the door. Now as a kid, this genuinely took me hours to figure out, but this puzzle scarred me so much that I knew how simple it was, and I remembered that I needed to read the clue from top to bottom instead of left to right. We dig in between the unbreakable bones as the clue told us, and we found a secret tunnel back to the entrance, allowing us to catch the BB bandits as they were escaping. We fought Vivian, but she didn't fare much better than her accomplices. After defeating her, we recover the treasure they'd stolen and return to the chieftain. The treasure ends up being some tacky idol that the village has no use for, so they let us take it as a reward. We travel back to Vivisor Town and see that it is once again time for a level up battle. This time, the level up master is none other than Nevada Monte Carlo herself. Aww, our first fight. Uh, isn't this adorable, guys? We give her some tough love and secure the rank of level 3 fighter. As a level 3 fighter, we gain access to Rivet Ravine, and we are informed that there is a fossil digging seminar that we can go to to help us find more fossils. We travel over and meet with Sam Minaro to attend his lecture. We dig up 8 fossil rocks like he asks, and in return, we receive our own dose of holy lightning, which allows us to see the elemental types of the fossils we dig up. We dig up an unsuspecting white neutral fossil that we revive into Megala. I take one look at this vivisaur and the lack of thoughts behind those soulless eyes, and I think there is no way that I will be putting it on my team. Little did I know that Megalo had one of the best abilities in the game and would be vital later on. Deep in the back of the ravine, we find the entrance to a mine shaft, and we meet a strange fellow by the name of McJunker, who is having trouble repairing a minecart. Apparently someone had busted it up and stolen his tools, giving McJunker no way to travel to his private digging site. We offer to help him repair his cart in exchange for being able to access his dig site. We scour the mineshaft's tunnels and find each of his tools, but they are both guarded by a BB grunt, who must have been behind the damaged minecart. We defeat them and bring McJunker his tools back, but he needs an Electrominite, which we can get from his junk depot back in town. We head back there and find Holt, who will give it to us in exchange for a fight, but he doesn't seem to understand how strong my vivisaurs are and goes down without a sweat. We bring the newly acquired Electrominite back to McJunker, who fixes the minecart and warns us that whoever destroyed the minecart might be on the other side of the tunnel. With an unwavering amount of confidence, we ride the cart down the tracks and enter the private dig site, where we find none other than the BB Bandit Trio from the Digga Digamid. We are forced to fight Rex and Snivels back to back, but they don't seem to have learned their lesson from the previous day, as we use Patchy and Goyle as a dangerous support duo to take them down. We send the bandits away with their literal and metaphorical tails between their legs, and we notice that there is something buried where they were standing. We dig it up to find a second tacky idol, this one much different in shape than the other. Back in the main tunnel, we meet up with McJunker and tell him that we solved his little problem, and he thanks us. He plans on going back to his junk depot, and we should head back too, since level up battles will be starting soon. We head back to the Vossel Stadium, ace our cleaning test, and then walk down the main hallway to see that McJunker is this level's level up master. We race through him faster than his own minecarts as Patchy goes to absolute work from the support zone. Blink and you'll miss it. Now we are a level 4 fighter. We wake up the next day and get access to Bottoms Up Bay, a fully underwater dig site. We are warned of denture sharks that are active in the area, and almost on cue, Rosie is in trouble as soon as we arrive. We need to sneak around all the sharks in order to get to Rosie safely, but once we do, the sharks go away and we can explore the dig site freely. While exploring, we find the head fossil for Elasmo, the fourth core member of our team. Elasmo is a large water type sea monster that can attack from long range. It'll definitely help us with the fire types later on. We head back underwater and look for the sunken ship of Captain Woolbeard, where we can look for buried treasure and fossils. After breaking a few rocks deep in the bay, we find an entrance to a secret area that harbors the sunken remains of the aforementioned pirate ship. Inside, we find plenty of fossils and chests containing money and other items. But far in the back, we find the entrance to the captain's quarters, where we find the ghost of Captain Woolbeard in the see-through flesh. He tells us how much he misses his amazing beard ribbon, and how he will give us the buried treasure of the sea if we were to retrieve it for him. We agree, but not before we are locked in the captain's quarters by Rex and Snivels. All hope is lost, but suddenly, a young woman dressed like a wish version of Zelda busts down the door, looks around the room, and leaves without elaborating further. We were a little confused, but hey, we can leave now. We go to Mr. Richmond and ask if he knows anything about the beard ribbon. He informs that a man by the name of Knickknack is in possession of the treasure, and that he is staying in the hotel. We pay Mr. Knickknack a visit, and he seems like an interesting fellow to say the least. He says that he will give us the beard ribbon in exchange for three items. First, he wants the molted shell of a fossil bug, so we head back to Digadig Village, where we are stopped by Rex, who got there before us. 
we destroy his team and send him whimpering out of Knotwood. Inside the village, we perform a molting ritual by vigorously shaking our hips with the chieftain. And we come into possession of one fossil bug shell. Second, Knickknack wants a right sandal fossil to match his left sandal fossil, because somehow sandals can be fossilized. We deduce that the best place to look would be where we found all of the trash in Greenhorn Plains. One boat ride later, and we see Snivels looking for the sandal first. We challenge him for the rights of the dig site, and our vivisaurs are more dangerous to him than a fistful of pollen. He leaves us, and the girl from the ship ends up giving us the sandal fossil, as she had found it earlier. Lastly, Knickknack wants a pair of dentures from a denture shark. Rosie has mild PTSD from this one, so she stays behind, sending me to fend off the sharks alone. Back underwater, we navigate carefully through the sharks and find an entrance to one of their dens. In the den, we spook a shark that had already taken their dentures out, allowing us to take them for ourselves. We sprint back to the hotel to deliver the last item to Knickknack, but Vivian intercepts us at the elevator and wants to fight us for the dentures. We oblige, but Spinax takes out her Elasmo while S-Raptor takes down her Earth Venusaurs. With all three of the BB bandits defeated, we finally give Knickknack the last of his requested items. With his sincerest gratitude, Knickknack gives us the fabled beard ribbon and we head back to Woolbeard's ship to give him his treasure. However, we are surprised to see that the BB bandits have beaten us there, but they were trying to give Woolbeard a fake ribbon. Now I don't know about you, but Captain Woolbeard looks like the kind of guy who knows his beard ribbons. He detects the fake and gets lost in a fit of rage, and the BB bandits book it, leaving us responsible to calm him down. He boasts one of the strongest water vivisaurs, Krona. This monstrous vivisaur can deal a lot of damage from almost any range, but with the type advantage, Spinax is able to wall most of its attacks so it can unleash a few devastating Spinax fangs to take it out along with the support dinos. After defeating the captain, we finally have an opening to put his beard ribbon on. With his long lost ribbon finally in his possession, Wolbeard calms down and thanks us for bringing it to him. As thanks, he gifts us with his treasure, which ends up being yet another tacky idol. We seem to be starting a small collection of these. With our sea excursion at an end, we head back to Vivisaur Town for our next level of battle. This time with Knickknack as our level up master. He only has air type vivisaurs, so Patchy is able to run rampant on him, unleashing earthquaking iron headbutts, making us a level 5 fossil fighter. The following day, something feels off. We leave our hotel and are stopped by a policeman who informs us that Captain Bulwart wishes to speak with us. We head over and Bulwart tells us that Rosie has been kidnapped by the BB bandits, and the only way that we can get her back is if we bring the idols that we found to the pier. After hearing this horrible news, we immediately head over to River Ravine to attend another seminar allowing us to find new fossil types. Come on, Rosie can wait a little bit. Just think of all the fossils we can find now. After our little detour, we pick up the idols from our room and head to the pier where we see an ominous looking boat. We approach it and are jumped by a BB Runt who we push aside real quick and hit the convenient autopilot button on the boat, taking us to BB Base. Inside BB Base we barge through, floor by floor, taking out any BB bandit standing in our way. Rex, buh bye Snivels, see ya. Vivian, I couldn't be less bothered. All of that fighting, and we finally get to the top to see Captain Bulwart with Rosie. The captain reveals himself to be Bartholomew Bulwart, boss of the BB Bandits. In this terrible betrayal, we get our vivisaurs ready to end the BB Bandits once and for all. Bulwart specializes in long range and long necked vivisaurs. A trio of Spinax, S Raptor, and Elasmo band together, chunking away at his team, until S Raptor is able to unleash a fiery S Fury, finishing Bulwart off. With Bulwark down, the police are able to catch up to us and arrest their now former police captain. Rosie thanks us for being saved and heads back to ease her grandfather's worries. We head back to Vivisor Town as well and meet Richmond in his office. We then learn that someone had hired the BB Bandits to gather all four idols for 10 billion G. Now if I had known that I had idols worth billions of G just sitting in my room, I would have tried to profit off that. But instead, I didn't, and Richmond takes the idols so that Dr. Diggins can inspect them more. Anyway... Time for another level up battle, I guess. This time, we need to finish our level up battles in a certain number of turns, and our level up master is none other than the man, Dr. Diggins. As smart as Diggins is, he doesn't seem to be the best at fossil battles, and we take him down under the turn limit, making us a level 6 fighter with only one more level until master fighter. That night, Rosie asks us to meet her at the pier to properly thank us for saving her all those times. She then asks us a brutally honest question, do we hate her? After a little deliberation with my chat, we decided that we do hate her, but we weren't going to tell her that. We tell her no, and then... Don't do fucking do it. No! Fuck. Fuck. See, I don't see where us saying that we didn't hate her turned into us liking her, but I wasn't a fan. Now this game seems like it's playing it pretty safe, but this is the point where the story gets crazy. You'll see what I mean. 
And if you're enjoying the video, consider leaving a like and subscribing with notifications on. These videos take a long time to make, and it's the best way to help support this channel. The next day, we leave our hotel and run into the fossil fighter known as Sorehead. He's quite a large man. He also wears a dino mask to hide his face, which no one has ever seen, and he is what stands between us and being a master fighter. At the harbor, Dr. Diggins upgrades our sonar to be able to find idols since there is still one more out there to find. With our upgraded equipment in hand, we travel to Mount Lava Flow, which is quite literally in the mouth of an active volcano. However, we can't get far, as a giant boulder is in our way, but Walmart Zelda comes again to save the day. Her name is Duna, and she tells us to stand back while she removes the boulder. Confused, we get behind her. Oh wait, oh, oh my god! Without knowing whether to be grateful or scared, we advance further into the volcano, where we find a cave blocked by yet another boulder. Duna comes in clutch once again and blows it to bits. Behind the boulder, we get a suspicious ping on our sonar. We dig it up to find the final idol. Our happiness doesn't last long, however, as Duna immediately demands that we give her the idol or else. During our confrontation, the heat seems to be messing with some type of holographic technology that Duna has, which fails, revealing her real form as some sort of dinosaur-human-alien hybrid. I told you, this gets kinda crazy. She attacks us, and she turns into a dinosaur, and uses two cyborg vivisaurs alongside her. Can we take one second to look at these support effects? My goodness. Thankfully, she didn't start with herself in the support zone, allowing Spinax to deal massive damage to her and her dynamitons and weaken her team before she can use her support effects. While strong, Duna can't quite get the edge on us, and we defeat her. Our fight seemed to have caused an earthquake, causing another large boulder to collapse, trapping Duna underneath. We go hard to work to destroy the boulder and free Duna. This seems to confuse her, as she just attacked us and doesn't understand why we saved her. I let her think that it was because us humans are selfless creatures, when in reality, it was because the boulder was trapping me in there too and I wanted to get out. Now that we have the final idol, we head back to Vivisaur Town, but Beth tells us that all of the BB Bandits have escaped from prison and have taken over the town, as well as the fact that Bullward has somehow come into possession of a legendary Vivisaur. Now at this point, there hasn't been a difficult fight yet, so I think that this is going to be a cakewalk. We head over to the Richmond building, where Bullward has set up shop, and battle him to see what this legendary Vivisaur is all about. Only to find out that his name is Friggy, it's ginormous, and we literally can't hit it. Friggy not only destroyed our team single-handedly, but froze Rosie and I solid. We get thrown in prison as we thaw out, but an unlikely savior frees us, Rex. He lets us out and escorts us to the basement of the Fossil Center, where Dr. Diggins and Richmond are hiding as well as Vivian and Snivels. The BB Bandits tell us that ever since Bullward obtained Friggy, he's been treating his bandits very poorly, and they were tired of him. We also learn that Bulwart obtained the legendary Vivisaur by tricking the Diggadig Chieftain, so they must be our key to defeating him. We travel to the village, and the Chieftain tells us that the only way to defeat the Ice Cold Friggy is to obtain his counterpart, the Flaming Hot Igno, and that its fossil is most likely located under the lava at Mount Lava Flow. Back at the warehouse, we decide that the best plan of action is to look for a valve that is supposed to shut off all of the flowing lava at Mount Lava Flow. We take Rex with us, but only after Diggins gives us a Doglish translator so that we can understand him. At the volcano, we learn that Rex speaks like an old Englishman, and that he has an idea where the valve is. We scour through another one of the caves in the back, and find the valve underneath a rock. We turn it, and suddenly we have turned Mount Lava Flow into just Mount, and we can explore it in its entirety. We find that the lack of lava gives us access to a new cave, where we find the legendary Igno fossil, only for Bulwark to come in and immediately zap it with his new Imperva Ray, making it impossible to break no matter how strong of a tool we use. We try to clean it at the fossil center, to no avail. But when all hope seems lost, Duna comes in out of nowhere and zaps the fossil, removing the effects of the Imperva allowing us to clean it. Duna explains that it was her way of thanking us for saving her. With the fossil finally cleanable, we do so carefully and revive it into the legendary Vivisaur, Igno. Now that we can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Friggy, we head back to the Richmond building and challenge Bulwark one final time. The power of Igno and Friggy colliding seems to nullify their powers, leaving them vulnerable for the first time. We then engage in a slugfest for the ages, exchanging blow after blow, but my support effects outweigh Bulwark's just enough to give Igno the edge over Friggy. Once Friggy is down, Igno can clean up the rest of his team and we win the battle. With Friggy gone, Igno seems to have fulfilled its purpose, as both fade out of existence. The police come to once again arrest the stunned Bulwark, and we have finally saved Vivisaur Island. Once all the commotion calmed down, it is time for our final level of battle against Sorehead. We had to do two preliminary fights before we got to the Dino-Headed Master, but we had to win them without losing a single Vivisaur. It was during this fight that I realized the potential of Megalo, who gained the new Power Scale ability. This ability sets both fighters' FP to the average of the two, 
so my goal was to use as much FP as possible to take out an opposing Vivisaur. Then once the opponent got a massive FP boost after losing a Vivisaur, I would simply steal most of it with Power Scale. It allowed me to unleash even more strong attacks per turn and keep my FP topped off when needed. With our team unlocking this new tech, we had our fateful battle with Swordhead, where we, once again, can't lose a single Vivisaur. But we had ranked up our team enough so that we were up to the task. He had a support Vivisaur that increased the attack in his AZ by 90%, so I had to lead with a LAS mode to get the type advantage and snipe it from long range before it could destroy my team. His last two Earth Vivisaurs were easily handled by S Raptor, who used the type advantage combined with Megalo's power scale to launch enough combos and furies to win the battle. After we win, Swordhead begins to see us as an equal, and we gain the final rank of Master Fighter. As we leave the stadium, we find a note from Duna, asking us to meet her at the pier at night. We oblige her request as we did Rosie's and she tells us that she is going away, and she is unsure if we will ever see her again. She tells us that she is a Dinorian, or a dinosaur person in other words. She believed that humans always wanted nothing but conflict and war, but we showed that humans aren't so bad. Like Rosie, she asks us a tough question. If humans and Dinorians were at war, and she was my enemy, would I still have saved her? I tell her yes, and she admits that even as a human, she likes us. Show you! Yeah! We did it! We got a little smooch! Duna leaves us, we are not sure if we will ever see her again. Waking up as a master fighter, we leave the hotel to be stopped by Rosie, who says that the idols seem to have some type of advanced technology in them, and Dr. Diggins is working on them in the secret lab of the Richmond building. We enter the Richmond building and are met by some type of dino mouse. We can't find anyone else on the first floor other than a guard, who seems to be in a trance, squeaking like the dino mouse was, but he tells us that we need to head to the underground lab right away. In the secret lab, we see Duna, with what looks like another Dinorian, stealing the idols. The Dinorian introduces himself to us as Raptor, and tells us that the idols are really called sub-idol comps. They are the key to their plan of wiping humans off the face of the planet. Raptor then shows that he isn't messing around. Oh, he's fucking dead! She's fucking dead! Oh, she's a mouse now. He turns Rosie into a dino mouse with some sort of de-evolution ray, and she attacks him out of anger. He kicks her to the ground and then aims his ray at us. Duna tries to stop him, but Raptin doesn't waver. Luckily, his ray was out of juice, and it simply knocked us out. The Dinorians teleport away with Duna's teleporter, since Raptin seemed to have lost his. We go right over to Richmond's office, as he is meeting with Dr. Diggins to go over what happened and what our best course of action should be. Turns out, Rosie ended up stealing Raptin's teleporter when she bit him, and she gives it to Dr. Diggins to inspect. But he ends up hitting a switch by accident, teleporting us along with himself out of the office. The teleporter takes us to the Dinorian mothership. We have now officially reached the point where this game becomes DINOSAURS IN SPACE. We are stopped by a Dinorian soldier who thinks that we have our human hologram disguise on still. So we leave the ship before anyone else gets suspicious, but it is obvious that we need a better disguise. We decide that we need to somehow get a mask from Sorehead, as it might allow us to blend in amongst the Dinorians and get the idols back. We head to the fossil stadium and find Sorehead. He tells us that the only way he will give us masks is if we defeat five of his teams in a row. It is a tall task, but most of his teams use one type, so we use those type matchups to our advantage, and then take out the mighty T-Rex on his final team. After accepting defeat, Sorehead takes off his mask to reveal, you guessed it, another mask. We then inform him that we need two masks, so he takes off the second one to reveal a third one, and he tells us that he wears 30 of those masks at a time so no one ever sees his face. I respect the commitment. With our new dino masks, we head back to Dr. Diggins and throw them on, before teleporting back to the mothership via a brand new teleporter he reverse engineered from Raptons. Once on board, our disguises work like a charm, and we can freely explore the ship to find the idols. Aboard the ship, we learn about Project Mother Planet. Millions of years ago, the Dinorians found Earth and planned to make it their home after theirs was destroyed by a large planet-eating monster. They had developed the technology to be put into stone sleep, so that they could wake up millions of years later and inhabit Earth. They had planted, quote, seeds of life that they had hoped would evolve into Dinorians, and the idol comp's jobs were to reset evolution if those seeds took an unexpected path. But once the sub idol comps were gone, there was no way for evolution to reset, and the Dinorians believed that's how humans came about. Now that we know their plan, it is time to put it to an end. We find the idol comp room and enter to find that the sub idol comps serve a much larger main idol comp, which can't function without them. We hear people approaching, so we hide, and in comes Duna alongside Dino, the king of the Dinorians. He instructs Duna to hit the switch on the main idol comp, reverting all humans to amoebas, but she hesitates. He threatens her to hit it, but then we jump in to stop him. Dino attacks us with Dynomaton guards, and those Robo Dinos are no match for the real deal. We defeated Dino's guards, but he was using it as a distraction to get to the main idol comp, 
However, in all the commotion, Dr. Diggins came up clutch and was able to remove one of the sub-idol comps and render the main one useless. The main idol comp then malfunctions and releases a large burst of energy that ends up teleporting Dr. Diggins, as well as the detached idol comp, all the way back in time to the Jurassic period, almost 150 million years in the past. Enraged, Dino begins to transform into a dinosaur to attack us, but Duna is able to get us out of there with her personal teleporter. And just like that, we are on the final chapter of the game. Back in Richmond's office, Duna tells him everything, including Project Mother Planet. We realize that the best way to stop the Dinorians is to find the missing idol before them. The three of us head down to the secret lab along with Rosie, who is back to normal after the effects of Raptor's ray gun wore off. Duna works her magic on the computer to locate a signal from the idol, only to find that the journey through time ended up splitting the idol into five pieces across the main dig sites. Luckily, no one is around any of them to stop us, and our idol sonar still works on fragments. We simply head over, dig up the fragments, and return them back to Duna. However, she notices something is missing, the idol's core, and there are no other signals being emitted from the island. Richmond comes forward and says that there is a secret dig site that he and Diggins have been hiding with cloaking and jamming technology. This dig site houses a Dinorian scout ship that crashed millions of years ago towards the start of Project Mother Planet, so there is a chance that the core might be there. We leave with Duna and inspect the crashed ship. Inside, we find someone deep in stone sleep, and can detect that they are holding the idol's core. Before we can leave and bring them back, we are stopped by Raptin, who attacks us in dinosaur form. He is quite the opposite of Duna's dino form, so instead of massively buffing his own AZ, he massively debuffs his opponent's AZ. So taking him out before his dinomatons is priority number one if we want to win. With Raptin being an air type, that lets Patchy two-shot him with iron missile from the support zone, and the low-tier god comes up big once again. We send Raptin hightailing it out of the ship, and we can finally bring this fossilized person back to the fossil center to retrieve the core. We start cleaning them off and reveal that it is actually Dr. Diggins from 150 million years ago, who had somehow gone back to the scout ship and put himself to stone sleep. We revive him just like we would a Vivasaur, and just like that, we have our good old doctor back. Now, I'm going to explain this real quick so you understand just how much of a beast Dr. Diggins is. Aboard the crashed ship, we found logs detailing his adventures of being stuck in the past. He spent six months trapped in the Jurassic period with actual dinosaurs. He survived attacks from T-Rexes, Stegosauruses, various sea monster dinosaurs, and more, just to get to the crash site and put himself in stone sleep, praying that someone would eventually save him. Now, I don't know many people who would survive that long in dinosaur-infested lands, but I sure am not one of them. But enough yapping about Diggins. We had the idol core. We head back down to the secret lab and meet Richmond there. He asks Rosie and I to put the idol back together for some reason, and we do, only to soon after see a second Richmond enter the lab. The first Richmond reveals himself to be Dinal in disguise. He steals the completed idol to bring it back to the ship and finish Project Mother Planet. We chase after him, teleporting onto the ship and fighting through waves of Dinorian soldiers to finally reach the main idol comp room, where Dinal is ready for us. In a battle that will decide the fate of two entire species, Dinal transforms into his dinosaur form and attacks us. Dinal's dinosaur form is like a stronger version of Raptin's, as his support values also destroy our attack stat, and his attacks do much more damage in general. He is not to be taken lightly. We bring Elasmo, Spinax, and Megalo in the final fight to save all of humanity. Dinal has attacks that are guaranteed to excite me, meaning that I cannot rotate any effective Divisor, so Spinax needs to hold his ground and take as much damage as possible before going down. Dinal eventually ends up in the support zone, setting himself up to cripple my AZ, but he decides to switch and give up his only advantage, allowing Megalo to finish him off before Elasmo takes out his last Dynamiton, ending the fight. Upon defeating him, Dino recognizes how much perseverance and resilience the human race has, and changes his view on us completely. He decides to shut down Project Mother Planet after we offer the idea that humans and Dinorians can live side by side on Earth. But there is still one problem. Raptin hasn't been swayed. He believes that the King has lost sight of his goals and does what he didn't have the courage to do. He hits the switch on the main idol comp, but then something interesting happens. There is no massive wipe of the human race, as we are not phased. The main idol comps come alive and explain that us humans have not evolved from the original seeds of life the Dinorians had planted, and those seeds died off not long after they first arrived. Humans came to be independent of any Dinorian interference, so the idol comps will have no effect on us. But while there is no regression ray being fired, a broadcast signal was sent. A signal that summons the monster that destroyed the Dinorian homeland. A monster that would swallow all of Earth whole if we did not stop it. Ganache. Panicking, we meet up with everyone in the basement of the fossil center and try to devise a plan. Do we accept death? Do we try to escape Earth with as many people as possible aboard the mothership? No. The best course of action is to attack Ganache head on. Diggins studied the monster during his time aboard the crashed ship and came to the conclusion that if we could destroy the monster's three brains, we would be able to save the planet. 
With no weapons capable of destroying it, our only option was to fight the brains in a fossil battle. Dino sets up the teleporter with the coordinates to Ganache's mouth and tells us that we could take one person with us. Rosie and Duna both offer to go, but without hesitation, I choose the alien dino chick who actually has experience with us and isn't extremely annoying. One teleportation later, we arrive in the mouth of the beast. We look around to see that the brains are approaching us and prepare for a fight that will once again determine the fate of humanity. For this fight, we bring Spinax, Megalo, and our sweet glorious king, Patchy. The brains are nothing to scoff at, with all three of them being unique in their own way. They have a strange ability that displaces my vivisaurs in the battlefield, but we get lucky a couple of times and get a lineup that is still beneficial to us. We send devastating blows back and forth until Megalo is able to get off one final combo and defeat the final brain, saving the world. Upon our victory, Duna attempts to teleport us back home, but Ganache is causing some type of interference, and we're gonna die if we don't come up with something fast. However, Duna has a backup plan, a portable stone sleep device that will protect us until Dino can recover and revive us back in the fossil center. We activate the device and survive Ganache's explosion as we begin to drift off into space. We wake up in the fossil center surrounded by our friends, but see no sign of Duna. It turns out that the stone sleep device didn't work as intended, and Duna seems to be stuck in stone sleep, forever, with no way to revive her. We go visit her petrified body in the park to say goodbye before Dino and the Dinorians leave Earth forever. But then, the Digga Dig Chief comes in and tells us that a little prayer and hip shaking may hold the key to saving Duna. I shake my hips like they've never been shaken before. And by some sort of miracle, the fossil gods restore Duna to her normal form, saving her once again. And now, with our friends as well as the world saved, the credits roll. When I first thought of revisiting this game, I forgot how fun it was. The digging and battling mechanics were really unique, and the story didn't take itself too seriously, with the humor never feeling cringy or out of place. It was this whimsical charm that firmly cemented Fossil Fighters as one of my most underrated games of all time, and I think anyone who likes Pokemon or other creature collecting games should try it for themselves. There was even a sequel, which I remember being even better in just about every way, so you may see me playing that sometime in the near future. Believe it or not, there is a small yet dedicated fanbase that loves this game just as much as I do. They have a Discord server, which I will link in the description below. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing with notifications on if you want to see more. I have a lot of cool video ideas coming, and you won't want to miss out on them. If you want to watch these playthroughs and other challenges live, check out my Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash Hope everyone has a good day, and thank you for watching.